talk just today on uh, the YM Matsui and the tobacco in the advertising wars of Meiji Japan. Um, she is here from one of the best uh, departments in the humanities that we, that we have, the history department, and her education has prepared her very well for, uh, for service in this very prestigious department. Uh, she came to Detroit after completing a BA in history in history and uh, East Asian Studies at Yale University and an MA in Japanese Studies at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, so two of the best universities, and then she went on to do a PhD in modern Jap Japanese history uh, at the University of Hawaii in Manoa, another prestigious university soon afterwards. When she arrived on campus, the history department had been without an Asian history historian for two decades. So one of her principal tasks was to rebuild the curriculum in Asian history. She did that by reviving an introductory survey of modern um, Asia and introducing courses on pre-modern and modern Japan. Uh, women in Japanese history and modern China. She has also taught a survey of the world, of world history since 1945 and the history department's capstone course uh, for majors, so she was very instrumental in building the, the reputation of the history department in that area. Um, for that work, she received a College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Excellence in Teaching Award in 2008 in recognition of her teaching skills and her, for her contribution to successful efforts to create a major and minor in Asian studies. Two years later, she published her first book, Reforming Japan, the Women's Christians Temperance Union in, Meiji, in the Meiji period. This study of religiously minded women's moral, social, and political activism in the late 19th and 20th century um, was one it was a study so impressive that it received a Humanity Center Faculty Fellowship Award, which meant that she participated in the, in the Faculty Fellowship Conference the next year. It also received an Association for Asian Studies first book subvention grant and is now being distributed in paperback at both the University of British Columbia Press and the University of Hawaii Press. She's also published a number of, of article length pieces on the Women's Christian Temperance Union and has presented her research in many places. Uh, her second book project explores the history of tobacco in modernizing Japan. She's undertaken two research trips to Tokyo to collect materials, some of which will serve as the basis for her talk today. So we are in the presence of a, of a senior scholar at the top of her game, and it's a pity that more people couldn't hear her talk. So next time I'm going to try and uh, schedule her at the regular time <laughs> in a more propitious uh, environment. So please welcome to the podium, Professor Elizabeth Dorn Lumen. Um, Walter, I, I've had this on my desk for about two years. Oh, okay. uh, And I've been meaning to give that to you right, right. Uh, and to the Amanda Center. Um, Thank and you. thanks for Thank you. the funding and support that you provided uh, in the... Wonderful, wonderful. We, celebrate, we celebrate our 20th anniversary um, in September of this year, and we'll be having a book exhibition. So this will, this will, this will, this will be good. Thanks. Uh, as as one of my just recently retired colleagues told me when I showed him the hard copy, he said it was a great hard cover. It will work very nicely to put a coffee cup under it, or to put a coffee cup on top of it, because then it won't stay in the dust jacket. Okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I should uh, say that uh, I'm, I'm responsible for the early start time. I did not realize that uh, I had signed up for a 12.30 to 1.30 time on a Wednesday when I have class from 12.50 to 2.40. So uh, Walter was very kind to accommodate me on this count. 
so uh, again, thank you on that count. As Walter mentioned, uh, I have embarked on a second research project, second book project, which is a look at the tobacco industry, more specifically production, consumption, promotion, and regulation of tobacco during the Meiji period. And the Meiji period, just for your reference, lasted from 1868 until 1912. Now, tobacco as a commodity helped to propel Japan's industrialization. It also served as a vital source of state revenue, it helped shape the world of advertising, and it contributed to the construction of a modern consumer culture. Scholars of Japan have, by and large, overlooked the impact of tobacco. And I would say that one of the reasons why they have ignored tobacco is because of contemporary stigmas against smoking. Uh, in Japan, smoking has only in the last decade come to be stigmatized and associated very strongly with uh, cancer, particularly lung cancer. And nonetheless, I think for Westerners, tobacco is not necessarily a sexy or glamorous or, or terribly appealing topic. Most of the work that has been done looking at particular industries and their impact on advertising, their impact on other kinds of government modernizing projects, uh, whatnot, they've looked at the silk industry. A lot of work has been done in the silk industry from the 1870s and the 1880s. Also, the railroad industry uh, has been a topic of a lot of historical study, but again, tobacco has not. Uh, so, one of the things that I'm doing is simply to give tobacco the credit it deserves. Uh, and to use it, another way of thinking of it, uh, and I should say I don't smoke. Uh, my father loves that I started with a book on drinking, and now I've moved to a book on smoking, and I have neither of these vices. Uh, maybe at some point I'll pick them up, but uh, at least it makes for a little bit of fun. Anyway, uh, doing the drug wars. What? I should be doing the drug wars. <laughs> uh, actually, my husband said I should be doing more with. Uh, prostitution and, and all of that. So, oh, I don't want to know why. He said I don't know. Uh, well, I think it was after Memoirs of a Geisha came out and turned into a movie and yeah, he thought, yeah. you know, I could actually make yeah, money sure, on something, sure, sure, yeah. uh, which is not happening. So, anyway, the, the other thing that I want to do uh, in the larger project is to use tobacco and use the tobacco industry as a lens or a vehicle for examining larger kinds of issues that pertain to the construction of modern Japan. Uh, one of the issues I'm interested in looking at is the relationship between the state and citizens. The common historical narrative uh, suggests that the state was all powerful uh, and that citizens were subject uh, and beholden to the state and adhere to all of the dictates and rules and, and laws and whatnot that the state issued. In my first book, I, I challenge that. Uh, in this book as well, with one of the chapters in particular, chapter uh, that is on opposition to smoking, particularly opposition to smoking by youth. Uh, it's a chapter that will deal specifically with this historiographical uh, point, again, the, the nature of the relationship between the state and citizens. Uh, I'm also looking at the ways in which, or interested in looking at the ways in which uh, those who were part and parcel of the industry, the entrepreneurs with their advertising, but also those who opposed smoking, the ways in which they talked about what it meant to be a good modern Japanese. Um, whether that meant smoking, if it meant smoking, what kind of smoking, how often, things of that sort. Uh, I'm also interested, as I had mentioned before, in the role that the industry played in backing up the state and advancing or funding various kinds of state projects. Uh, over the course of the Meiji period, the state earned a lot of money in peacetime and in wartime to fund its various kinds of programs, and I'm interested in looking more specifically at how seminal the, the role tobacco played uh, in enabling the state, the Meiji state, to become the Japanese Empire. To, to move and create overseas colonies. In short, I'm looking to uh, comment, extrapolate, explore, expound on the impact of tobacco uh, in Japan's modernization, um, particularly during the Meiji period. For the talk today, I want to focus on what will be one chapter of the larger book project. Uh, the book itself, I'm looking right now at five chapters. The first chapter will be a uh, history uh, of tobacco smoking up until the early part of the Meiji period, or up until actually the 1850s. Uh, introduction of tobacco, consumption of tobacco, paraphernalia for tobacco, the state's response to um, the growing of tobacco and the consumption of tobacco, the one chapter. The second chapter will be looking at uh, changes in the industry itself uh, after the introduction of cigarettes. Uh, another chapter will be looking at um, advertising. Um, and this chapter, this paper for today, uh, is kind of the basis in the early research that I have done for that particular chapter. Another chapter will be looking at opposition, as I said. And the last chapter will be uh, an exploration of the state's creation of a tobacco monopoly in 1904. <clears throat> so for today, uh, what I'd like to do, uh, I've got the paper broken up into several sections. 
Uh, the first I wanted to provide you just for your own reference with a very brief history of, of tobacco in Japan up until the 1850s um, with a few comments on the nature of advertising uh, during those, uh, those decades, during the early, de or the early centuries rather, of tobacco consumption in Japan. Uh, then I'm going to look at, very briefly comment rather, on changes from the 1850s on in terms of the smoking culture. Uh, and then introduce first Iwaya Matsuhei, uh, and then his rival, um, Murai Kichibe, who were the two tobacco kingpins of the Meiji era. Look a little bit at their histories, what they did, and then dive into the wars in which the two engaged. And the wars themselves uh, contributed to the modernization of Japan because the, this, the prompt or the stimulus that uh, the two provided in trying to best the other and trying to outsell the other did contribute quite significantly to improvements in printing technology. Uh, it also in introduced a variety of different kinds of tactics or techniques into advertising. Uh, and then we have the money that was made um, simply through the fact that they were selling more and more cigarettes, which were taxed. Uh, that money contributed to the state itself. So let me begin with a brief overview of the history of tobacco uh, in the Tokugawa period or in the Edo period. Uh, the history of smoking in Japan dates back from the late 1500s, less than a century after Europeans took up the custom. Though the exact year of origin is unknown, reference to the existence of a dealer in tobacco in 1576 uh, land tax registers um, reveals that leaves have become a commodity at least by then. So by the late 16th century, uh, tobacco was being taxed and, and it was recognized as a sellable good. That timing in turn makes the Portuguese the most probable introducers uh, of tobacco into Japan, and that's because the Spanish did not arrive on Japanese soil until 1592. The English and the Dutch arrived thereafter. Consumption originally took the form of cigarettes and was limited. Supply played a role in the limited nature of consumption, uh, but more significant was the cost of tobacco. At roughly 11 grams of silver for a single leaf, uh, the price was prohibitive for all but the, the wealthy. And that changed in the first decades of the Tokugawa period, in the first decades of the, uh, the 1600s. And it did because domestic cultivation of tobacco, of the tobacco plant, began in earnest. Such significant amounts of fertile land were reallocated for growing tobacco plants that the shogunate outlawed their cultivation, also outlawed the act of smoking, also outlawed sales of leaves in 1612. Now the central objective behind this prohibition was to maintain adequate food production. Most land was otherwise used for rice, which was also the taxed, the taxed commodity. That was the, uh, what the, the government, the shogunate and domain regimes got their tax money from. Uh, the penalties the shogunate stipulated uh, did little to curtail production and consumption. Uh, and basically the, the prime penalty early on was to confiscate tobacco and then to give it to the person who had ratted out the producer or the seller, which simply kept it in circulation. Um, didn't do anything to limit production or consumption. Over the next decade, the shogunate issued a number of additional bans, all with the same minimal effect. Ordinances from later in the 17th century show that Tokugawa officialdom had shifted from the early attempt at eradication to oversight. And it stipulated that smoking could only be done inside homes and that tobacco could only be grown on specially reclaimed land. Now, over the course of the Tokugawa period, as the economy flourished, land, a lot of land was reclaimed, much of that land used for tobacco cultivation. Enforcement uh, of these kinds of restrictions proved to be rather limited, and tobacco production grew significantly uh, in response to the flourishing habit of Japanese who liked to light up. And I say Japanese, Japanese of all classes. Uh, smoking was not a practice, habit, custom, whatever you want to refer to it as, uh, was not something that was restricted simply to the elite, uh, but even uh, peasants, uh, low-level artisans, merchants, whatnot, also took to lighting up. Over the course of the Tokugawa period, those who did smoke typically did through uh, smoke using a pipe, which was known in Japanese as a kiseru, which is a pipe that had a long stem, usually made of bamboo, um, and had a metal or clay little bowl at the end. Some of the pictures of pipes you know, there may be this long, some out to here. Uh, differences in the nature of the pipes, in the adornishments to the pipes, uh, became quite common, and those reflected status. Uh, those reflected, uh, clearly, uh, economic well-being, wealth, whatnot. Uh, but again, the main point here is that, irrespective of political, economic, or social status, 
Japanese, uh, also of age or gender, uh, Japanese became regular consumers of tobacco in the Tokugawa period. During the same time, the artisans who crafted the pipes, who crafted the tobacco trays, the pouches, and other tobacco or smoking paraphernalia, as well as the merchants who sold and, or rather bought and resold the shredded tobacco that Japanese smoked, they used a variety of different means to hawk their goods. Many were quite active in marketing their products in castle towns, uh, and over time they became quite active in marketing their goods in local and regional market towns, which came to replace early urban centers as the most uh, vibrant um, commercial areas. One common advertising technique was to put up wooden signboards in front of shops, signboards that identified the goods for sale along with their prices. Some of these also identified uh, if the goods were specialty goods from a particular region. Over the course of the Tokugawa period, there was a move towards uh, specialization, regionalization, and the development of um, model, not model goods, but goods that were, in, in Japanese we refer to them as uh, omiyagi, in other words, presents that are things that are specific to a particular region, uh, that region becomes known for that. So the origins of some goods, that those also came to be put on some of these sign boards. Those with enough spare money also would commission artists to design woodblocks. In other words, to design the image that would then be carved out onto a woodblock and the woodblock then used to, pre, uh, to produce colorful flyers, promotional calendars, uh, and advertising lists. Some of those same documents or pieces of paper were also used or were distributed simply because they were used as wrapping. So if someone went into a store, a merchant who had produced various kinds of flyers would wrap up often wrap up the good that was sold um, and give it then, in the case of calendars, these were given out, also sometimes wrapped up, with goods wrapped up, and the calendars were then displayed in, in homes. Still others used what we, can, we now think of as product placement. More specifically, they paid to have their goods and store names included in the dialogues of popular kabuki plays um, and mentioned as part of other theatrical performances. Such efforts have been termed part of the prehistory or pre-modern history of Japanese advertising. While lively and in some cases new, these activities predated the introduction of mass media and remained essentially local. Uh, they also remained essentially shop specific. Uh, so an individual shop would produce its own advertising materials and distribute, that, and distribute those but within a very narrow geographical range. That changed in the latter decades of the 19th century. And tobacco-related advertising played a seminal role in helping to modernize the business of selling. Now, fundamental changes in the tobacco industry itself provided the impetus for changes in advertising. As I've already mentioned during the Tokugawa period, tobacco was consumed primarily in shredded form and in pipes. In 1858, Japan was forced through gunboat diplomacy to conclude unequal treaties with the United States, England, and a number of other Western imperialist powers. Provisions in those treaties effectively opened Japan to the outside world. Uh, up until this point, Japan had had trade with China, Korea, and the Ryukyu Islands, which are now known as Okinawa. Uh, with the West, trade had been restricted strictly to the Dutch, because they were the one foreign entity or European entity that promised not to proselytize in Japan. Uh, and they were confined to a very small man-made island in the harbor of Nagasaki, and were restricted in terms of the amount of trade that they could conduct to a number of ships uh, a year. These unequal treaties uh, ended that very limited nature of Japan's uh, outside contact or contact with the outside world, uh, resulted in the opening up of a number of different treaty ports, allowed foreigners to reside in Japan in these treaty ports. There were also tariffs that were imposed or set through these treaties that made trade with Japan very advantageous and profitable for Western countries. One of the earliest items imported into Japan after the opening of the treaty ports was the cigarette. This was both for consumption by foreign residents, and the foreign community was slow to take off. Um, first treaty ports opened up in 1859. By 1860, there were maybe 60 to 80 foreigners, uh, all men, in Yokohama, which was the, the very first of the treaty ports to open. But over the course of the 1860s, the number, and then certainly into the 1870s, the number of foreigners increased quite noticeably. Cigarettes, in short order, became a very popular commodity among Japanese. One reason was that cigarettes were simply easier to smoke. They were more convenient. You didn't need all of the, the, the contraptions, the paraphernalia uh, that, was, that were necessary for smoking a pipe. 
was smoking a pipe, you needed typically, again, this whole big tobacco tray in which you had the brassiere, you had the lighter, you had a place to put the ashes, uh, whatnot. A cigarette could be held in a little bit of a pouch, carried around to get more, a bit more inconvenient, especially after the introduction of matches as well. Um, and then, really, all you needed was a little, a little ashtray. Um, another reason why cigarettes took off as they did was that they carried with them the aura of sophistication. They carried with them the aura of Western civilization. And they appealed to many Japanese who saw smoking as something that would make them appear more enlightened. And the same rationale uh, played into the increase in popularity in the 1860s into the 1870s of beer, champagne, whiskey, uh, bread, <coughs> meat, various kinds of Western um, consumer products that, again, the Japanese associated uh, with them this, this national project of enlightening and civilizing uh, the Japanese population. Now, the quantity of cigarettes that Japanese uh, consumed reached such, such heights that the new Meiji government, uh, ever mindful of the need for revenue to finance modernizing projects, instituted a system for taxing cigarettes in 1876. That was eight years after the overthrow of the old feudal government and the creation of a new government uh, that was in the process of creating a new national legislature, uh, was 14 or 13 years away from adopting a constitution. Early attempts to manufacture Japanese brands were made around the same time, so in the mid-1870s, uh, though the Japanese brands were far inferior at this point in time to the imported ones. By the early 1880s, however, a handful of Japanese companies had opened factories and they were beginning to acquire some market share. Over the next two decades, the last two decades of the 19th century, the number of Japanese businesses engaged in the manufacture of cigarettes exploded. Statistics from 1896 revealed that there were just shy of 5,000 different companies then making cigarettes. Uh, and they produced either plain cigarettes or mouthpiece cigarettes. Um, and just to give you a, an indication, so the mouth or the plain cigarette required, and these were plain and mouthpiece, these were terms that were quite standard in English. Uh, in the case of Japanese, mouthpiece simply became kuchitsuke. Uh, the plain cigarette required the attachment of a, a mouthpiece, either wood or ivory or something, uh, that the Japanese would attach the cigarette to and then they would smoke through. In the case of the mouthpiece cigarettes, as you can see here, uh, the tobacco is the black part, you have the little mouthpiece, uh, which would be in the place of a filter today, and then the paper wrapped around on the outside. Now initially, costs or production costs were high with cigarettes. And they were high because early on, factories used very limited machinery. Um, things were made virtually uh, entirely by hand. It was particularly true of the mouthpiece cigarettes. Minimal profits kept many a company from expanding. And most factories employed only a small number of workers. Again, if I'm talking about almost 5,000 factories, a uh, huge part of the industrial infrastructure. Nonetheless, again, many of these were quite small. Women. Uh, were the majority employee in these particular factories. And again, that had to do with the, the handicraft, in a sense, nature, uh, the tedious nature of the work itself. Also because they were relatively cheap labor. By the end of the 19th century, only a handful of cigarette companies had multiple factories with sizable workforces. The best known and biggest among these cigarette companies were the Iwaya Company and, the, and Mirai Brothers. In 1902, Iwaya had eight factories uh, located across the country, two in Tokyo, two in Kyoto, others more regionally. Uh, and these eight factories employed 1,500 workers who made, on average, 10 million cigarettes a day. Mirai had four factories with just shy of 4,000 workers. So it had fewer factories, but it had more than double the number of workers of its competitor. Uh, and those workers, not quite as productive, they only made 6 million cigarettes a day. Combined, these two companies, these two out of the almost 5,000, employed roughly 33% of all those who were engaged in the tobacco industry. Effectively, they created a kind of cigarette monopoly when together. By no means, though, were these two companies friendly and cooperative. Quite the opposite, they engaged in bitter competition beginning in the last decade of the 19th century to surpass the other in sales. The lengths to which they went in advertising to try to best the other gave rise to what became known as the Meiji Tobacco Advertising Wars. Now, I don't have a picture of Mirai, but here's uh, Iwaya, nice upstanding gentleman. He was the man behind the Iwaya company. 
He was born in 1849 in the domain of Satsuma, which had historically been on the outs with the Tokugawa shogunate because it had fought against the shogunate in the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600. In the two plus centuries after that battle, Satsuma had maintained a proud tradition of, proud spirit of independence, and it rose up again in the 1860s and helped oppose and then overthrow the Tokugawa, doing so in the name of the emperor. Satsuma was also a domain that had a disproportionate number of samurai as part of its uh, population, uh, more martially oriented. It also tended to be one of the most conservative. Even though uh, its members were, were behind the overthrow of the Tokugawa, again, they tended to be the most conservative. They also tended to be the most patriotic uh, of Japanese moving into the late 19th century, moving into the Meiji period. In 1869, just one year after the end of the shogunate, Iwaya succeeded to the head of his household and took over the family store. Uh, after it was destroyed by fire in 1877, he decided to relocate to the new national capital of Tokyo, and there opened a store that initially sold kimono cloth and specialty goods from his home domain of Satsuma. Shortly thereafter, he decided to try his hand at manufacturing and selling mouthpiece cigarettes. From the outset, he employed a large number of workers. Some rolled cigarettes in their own homes on commission, uh, others worked in his factories. To make uh, those working in the factories a bit more productive, Iwaya, at some point, it's unclear at what point, purchased a patent for a machine that was de designed by a Japanese inventor, a machine that was a foot pedal cigarette filler. In other words, uh, an individual working in a factory operated it with a foot, and it was something that uh, then, with the paper rollers, would insert the, the tobacco itself, uh, possibly sort of compressed the tobacco so that it could be pushed in rather easily. Not very sophisticated. This machine did uh, prove to be revolutionary. It, is, uh, it introduced a new kind of technology um, to the making of cigarettes that increased the efficiency and output of workers. When it came time to sell the cigarettes his employees were making, Iwaya showed off his advertising acumen. One of the earliest decisions he made was to brand his cigarettes after the Tengu. Now, Tengu, the word, literally translates as heavenly dogs. Uh, if you see on the, the upper right, so at this point in time, Japanese was written uh, right to left. So you've got Tengu. Uh, Tengu, as I said, originally tra or translates literally as heavenly dogs, and it refers to spirits described in Japanese folklore and Japanese uh, literature and Japanese mythology. Early depictions of the Tengu showed it with both uh, avian and human characteristics or human traits. Over time, the image of a red goblin with a long nose became standard. And I apologize, I only have two photos, two images that are in color. Uh, my husband did the work, I can blame him for not doing the color. Uh, a bit more impressive in the color, but um, imagine this gentleman with his face a, a bright red. Now, I haven't found any serious discussions as to why Iwaya chose the Tengu as the image the, the symbol, whatnot, for his cigarettes. One historian has postulated that when Japanese first encountered Westerners, they thought that the foreign nose resembled the Tengu's long nose. Uh, and given that cigarettes were of foreign origin, the Tengu as an exotic was a fitting symbol. Uh, a simpler reason may simply be that the Tengu is eye-catching. Uh, and Iwaya was looking for some kind of gimmick that would resonate with all Japanese. And all Japanese were very familiar with the image of the Tengu. The reason aside, Iwaya included Tengu in the names of many of his brands. He repeatedly depicted the Tengu on cigarette cartons and in advertising materials. And he even went so far as to use a garish shade of red um, for the front of his stores. Here, again, you can't see it. Um, for his advertising in delivery vehicles and for the jackets he and his sales and marketing people wore. One thing with this I just wanted to point out, if you can see the Tengu, this is the, uh, the Iwaya headquarters located in the Ginza shopping district of Tokyo. And if you can see, there's the Tengu projecting from the side of the building. Again, Iwaya making it very clear uh, that this, this was uh, a, a tobacco store. Iwaya's marketing, oh, let me move, no, oh, okay. Um, Iwaya's market or advertising schemes did not end there. From the introduction of his very first cigarette, he pioneered in new ways to sell his products. 
One of the most important was to buy advertising space in newspapers and magazines. Now, broadsheets had circulated during the Tokugawa period, but it wasn't until the 1870s when a mass media really emerged in Japan. Iwoya was one of the first to take advantage of this new medium. He also distributed attractive, or he distributed attractive posters and handbills, put up signboards, created songs, invested heavily in appealing packaging, and formed an advertising brigade to sell his cigarettes. Uh, so in this case, on the left, there's a poster. Actually, they're both posters. Uh, in both cases, you have the Tengu appearing. Uh, Right up there, clearly right there. Uh, attractive nonetheless, certainly very colorful, uh, eye-catching. Uh, at this point in time, um, an image of a, of a woman like that, uh, some say would have been scandalous, but if you look at some of the woodblock prints, uh, particularly what are known as shunga or uh, pornographic woodblock prints from the Tokugawa period, there, there's nothing sensational about this in and of itself. Um, anyway, uh, with the Bicycle Brigade, um, Iwaya hired boys, young men, to ride around in bicycles and had the red jackets on uh, that advertised, but they also had either flags uh, sticking up from the back of their bicycles or little lanterns that advertised. Uh, now, they probably attracted less attention because of their red coats and their advertisements, uh, and more because bikes at this point in time were still a rarity and they were quite expensive. Collectively, all of these efforts helped to make Iwaya's mouthpiece cigarettes a very popular commodity. The success led him to adopt for himself, um, and he was rather uh, egotistical in this, to adopt for himself the tobacco publicity king. This success and the possibility of making money from the manufacture of cigarettes did not go unnoticed. Among those entrepreneurs who were spurred on to make cigarettes themselves was a gentleman by the name of Mirai Kichibe. And I apologize, I don't have a picture of him up. Uh, Mirai was born in Kyoto in 1864 and was thus Iwazia's junior by about 15 years. Unlike his future rival, Mirai grew up in a family that had long been engaged in the tobacco business, so it was not a stretch for him to venture into cigarette production. He did so in 1890 with help from an American who taught him how to roll a plain cigarette. He did a cigarette that didn't have the mouthpiece inserted into it. The following year, uh, this is the uh, following year, uh, so in 1891, he began sales of his first brand, Sunrise. Uh, and if I can just juxtapose this for a minute with the two posters from Mirai, uh, both have, to an extent, the, sort of the, the two cigarettes crossing over the land of the rising sun. That's also the sunrise, a little bit Japanese, his own image. I guess they do have his image. Uh, but no English here, a lot of English here. Um, this is one of his own uh, advertising gimmicks. Early sales in the Kyoto area were promising enough that he decided to give the Tokyo market a try. In 1892, he opened a store in Tokyo, not very far from Iwaya's headquarters. This move squarely positioned him as a competitor of Iwaya, but the rivalry didn't really take off until a few years later. The first big spark that came, uh, that the first big spark um, for that came in part from Iwaya's, or from rather from Mirai's trip to the United States in 1893. Mirai traveled to see the World's Expo in Chicago, and he took advantage of his uh, his travels to the United States to learn as much as he possibly could about the American cigarette industry. He traveled to cigarette factories, he traveled to plantations, whatnot. By all accounts, he was interested in everything from the growing of tobacco to the making of cigarettes to strategies for marketing them. His interest in all things related to American tobacco prompted his decision to use only imported tobacco in his cigarettes in the future. That decision became a reality in 1894 when he introduced to the Japanese market a brand called Hero. Here you have uh, Japanese clearly on the left, but the very common packaging once again showing the, uh, his, his motto ended up becoming then the two cigarettes crossed uh, with the rising sun, which is also the English translation for Nihon, which is the word for Japan, uh, in the background. Hero quickly grew in popularity, and not just because it had a unique flavor, different tobacco, imported tobacco, had a unique flavor compared to cigarettes made with domestically grown tobacco. The timing was also advantageous for Mirai. The Sino-Japanese War broke out five months after Hira cigarettes hit the market. Cigarettes in general were seen as a commodity that could help ease battle tension and weariness, and so soldiers were provided with cigarettes on a regular, ba uh, regular basis. These rations, so to speak, increased demand, and Mirai was among the producers of cigarettes 
who were happy to meet it with increased production. So was Iwia, and the, the two embarked in the last years of the 19th century on a fierce competition to dominate the market. Two factors at the turn of the century fueled the, comp the competitive fire between Iwia and Murad. First, in 1898, the government created a monopoly on the sale of domestically grown tobacco leaves. Not a wholesale monopoly, but just on the sale of tobacco leaves grown in Japan. Now, while Murai had moved to use imported tobacco exclusively, Iwaya used only tobacco leaves that had been grown in Japan. This monopoly and the related increase in the sales price of Japanese tobacco thus hit Iwaya, but not Murai. Second, just one year later in 1899, Murai accepted a huge infusion of capital from American tobacco. That money turned Murai into the most powerful cigarette maker in Japan and enabled him almost overnight to mechanize his factories and begin targeting consumers outside of Japan, particularly uh, in Asia. In short, these two factors, the government monopoly and this capital uh, from an American entity, gave the internationalist Murai an edge over the patriot Iwia. This fact was not lost on Iwia, and the competition between the two took on a decidedly vicious tone. One of the most obvious ways in which Iwia responded was to emphasize the fact that he used domestically grown tobacco leaves. He also began to adopt very pointed names for his different brands of cigarettes. Um, okay, there we go. Uh, among the most popular <coughs> were Kokuet Tengu, which translates as National Interest Tengu, Aikoku Tengu, which translates as Patriotic Tengu. Uh, the bottom one is the Kokueki, the national interest. Uh, and then my personal favorite, the Yunyu Taiji Tengu, which translates, and this is the top one, the import exterminating Tengu. Uh, the catchphrases that Iwaya adopted were likewise not so subtle attacks on Murai. One likened the Iwaya company to a charitable corporation because it employed thousands of women and in employing them, it gave them wages and enabled them to support their own families. Another uh, catchphrase pointed out that the Iwaya company paid tens of thousands of yen in taxes, thanks to the government monopoly on tax leaves and, and also other kinds of taxes. Uh, that tax money, in turn, provided the government with the essential revenue it needed. So in other words, this was a company that was supporting uh, the nation state. Such wording was provocative, and it was intentionally so. Iwaya wanted to position himself in public opinion as loyal and patriotic to the nation state. At the same time, he wanted to turn public opinion against Murai by inferring that his rival was the opposite. In other words, that Murai was disloyal and unpatriotic. Murai did not take the bait. To put it another way, he did not bend to Iwaya's charges that his loyalties were suspect. And he did not try to make his cigarettes appear across the board more Japanese. He continued to play up the fact that he used imported tobacco. He continued to use, oh, there's Aikoku, there's the patriotic one. Um, sorry about that. Uh, he continued to use, you see it a bit more on the left, he continued to use uh, foreign words in his brands. Um, in this case, you still have Hiro, uh, written in, in Japanese, but uh, still clearly a foreign title. The image on the second, on the, the right side, the colored image, there's nothing remotely Japanese about it except for the characters. Here and there. So again, uh, Murai continued to use foreign words for his brands. He continued to include English on his packaging. In short, he continued to emphasize the fundamental differences between his cigarettes and Iwaya's. In so, in so doing, he joined Iwaya in drawing the lines. Their battle essentially became a competition between East and West. Also became a competition between two different kinds of cigarettes. Uh, Murai made plain cigarettes. Iwaya made mouthpiece cigarettes. Uh, there was also a color competition, white, red, Iwaya, uh, very clearly the red. There's, there's not much yet I found that suggests that white was associated with Mirai, uh, but there was one point of comparison I, I did see one place. Uh, but essentially this was a competition between a Japanese brand and a not Japanese brand, produced in Japan, but essentially not, more a Western style brand using imported tobacco. This was a battle that escalated after the turn of the century. Both Iwaya and Murai increased the number of advertisements they took out in newspapers. Uh, the location of both of their offices, uh, where Iwaya's headquarters, Iwaya's headquarters were originally, where Murai created a new office when he eventually moved to Tokyo. Both were near the Ginza district that was also home to most of the major newspapers uh, and publishing companies. So they were in the midst of this, this cluster. 
both developed very close relations with a variety of different periodicals, and in the early part of the, 19th, the early part of the 20th century, put out more and more ads, just kind of in this, this fierce back and forth that really was a, a back and forth, a tit for tat, so to speak. And that tit for tat also extended to their, their development of new products, new kinds of new brands of tobaccos. As soon as one put one out, then the other felt compelled to put something out. Now, and they, in, in a sense, flooded the market both with advertising and with products. They both also adopted new printing technologies to help try to help them make the most attractive packaging, posters, flyers. They tried new gimmicks um, on, for Mirai. He began making game boards that advertised his various brands of cigarettes. He also took to inserting into cigarette cartons uh, what were known as cigarette cards. These were initially added, and they were initially added, developed in, in the West, initially added to reinforce the packaging, give it, give it some strength. And as such, they encouraged sales. Um, most of them included artistic renderings of animals, of nature. Um, customers saw them as free gifts, uh, and that contributed to the sale. Uh, the, the cards in Japan, and I apologize, I don't have a picture, the cards in Japan that Mirai distributed also were used as trump cards. They were like a deck of cards. So you'd need to buy, what, 54 packs of cigarettes and hope that you got one different card in each so you can put together your deck of cards. Um, anyway, they, they certainly helped to promote sales. Um, they also prompted uh, a ban on the, from the Home Ministry. This is a ban that came out after uh, Mirai in, inserted or had inserted <coughs> some artistic pictures of naked women. Apparently that was a little bit too much. So the Home Ministry put a ban on those particular packages. Iwaya and Mirai even turned, or even managed to turn the 1903 National Industrial Exposition in Osaka into an opportunity to challenge the other. On this occasion, Mirai prevailed hands down. For the expo, he constructed a very tall tower. The top sported a huge globe with an advertisement for cigarettes in white. Just below the globe was an observatory level. Now the height and the 15,000 attached searchlights at the top allowed the expo's attendees to enjoy a very nice panoramic view of the fairgrounds as well as the city, both during the day and at night. Uh, anyone walking into the fairgrounds could not miss this colossal structure. It was, it was the biggest, it was the tallest uh, of any of the exhibits. Uh, Iwai, uh, Iwaya, on his part, um, put together a rest house where Japanese visitors, visitors to the expo could relax with a nice cigarette, uh, but his rest house paled in comparison to this, this tower, this observatory tower that Mirai built. One year after the expo, the competition between Iwaya and Mirai came to an abrupt halt. And it did because in 1904, the government established a total monopoly over the tobacco industry. One of the biggest causal factors behind the government's move was the need to raise revenue for the impending war against Russia. Another was fear that American tobacco and other foreign firms might gain a stranglehold over the industry to the detriment of the Japanese economy. And Mirai had actually played into that fear by accepting a huge capital, a huge infusion of cash from American tobacco. Yet a third factor may very well have been the advertising war between Iwaya and Mirai. Their advertising was, to quote a publication from Tokyo's Tobacco and Salt Museum, there is actually a Tobacco and Salt Museum in Tokyo. Uh, anyway, this publication referred to their advertising war as excessively ostentatious. Some ads and the cigarette cards I just mentioned with the naked ladies uh, had also shocked sensibilities. The government then may also have acted to curb advertising excesses and to promote public morality as well as a degree of frugality in business activities. The private management of the tobacco industry ended in 1904, uh, wasn't revived until 1985. Uh, it did have a profound impact while it lasted. More specifically, Iwaya and Mirai, the two most important of the tobacco kingpins during the Meiji period, had a profound impact. First, they were responsible for introducing a variety of new ways to advertise goods. They thought out of the box. And in thinking out of the box and introducing these new ways, they shaped not just the advertising environment of their day, but advertising into, well into the 20th century. Second, they stimulated the development of the printing industry, as well as of uh, the development of the tobacco industry, the mechanization, with their introduction in the, uh, of the latest in processes and techniques. And in some respects, it was more important for the, the printing industry, the packaging, the extent to which they invested in uh, new means to produce the most attractive packages and the number of packages that they produced uh, was the stimulus factor, a uh, stimulating factor that spread over into or extended over into um, 
advertising for other kinds of commodities. Third, through their purchases and their sales, they provided much of the money that the government needed to carry out its host of reforms. In short, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the main points that I'll be looking at in the book is that tobacco, Iwaya, and Marai played seminal roles in the modernization of Japan. Thank you. wondering uh, if you plan to deal somewhat with the imagery. You did refer to it in terms of Western images and so on and so forth. But it's sort of from an advertising standpoint, the underlying values, perspectives, uh, images of men and women, gender issues and so on that are applied. You're just even looking at uh, what you've shown here mm -hmm. some interesting things. Have you, uh, will you be doing things with that? Will you be thinking about that? I, I will be. I just haven't yet. Um, the analysis of the, the advertisements, the, the cartons, the packages, the posters, whatnot, has been mostly superficial at this point. Um, and it's uh, really kind of what, what is very obviously falling into the category of helping Mirai establish himself as a, as a Western, uh, more enlightened, more civilized, uh, more modern kind of individual, and Iwaya playing up his patriotic stance. But yes, I do intend to look more at what, what other kinds of subliminal, subliminal messages are coming through in the selection of uh, these different images. Um, that's going to require not just a look at um, Western or, or analyses of advertising in the West in general, but also what analyses there are of the history of advertising imagery in Japan itself. Maybe next year? <laughs> um, do you know if... Uh, the competition or advertising wars increase sales? And do you know what impact it might have had on prices? So, you know, the, as you laid it out here, you know, you, you talk about the very interest, the way it, 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 cigarette advertising kind of, what innovations this campaign had on the act of advertising, but advertising is focused on consumer behavior. So, do you have any idea of whether? This, they were just fighting over a sort of a static market, or whether they actually expanded a market that they came into through the advertising campaign? They were not fighting over a static market. Okay. Uh, I don't have hard and fast figures, mm -hmm. but um, the, the trend away from pipes and towards the, the, the smoking of tobacco through pipes uh, to smoking tobacco through mouthpiece or plain cigarettes that began in the 1860s and the 1870s uh, continued in rapid fire into the early 20th century. Uh, and pipes, for all intents and purposes, really kind of disappeared as the means by which Japanese smoked. Uh, you also had increases in the population uh, and the same distinction about, uh, the, the distinction I made before, the point I made before about uh, those who smoked in the Tokugawa period, it didn't matter age, uh, right, gender, yeah, yeah, status, yeah. That remained true uh, into the 20th century. Now, uh, in, in 1900, the government did pass, or the national legislature did pass a bill to ban smoking by minors. Uh, and what that age was, is minor? Hmm? What age is minors? Uh, I think it's, I, if I remember correctly, it's 18 and below. Oh, okay. Um, actually, it might have been 20 and below. I have to go back and, and look at the specifics. But uh, anyway, the, the number of Jap population increased, the same uh, consumption demographics remained the same short of then youth uh, being prohibited from smoking. Um, but again, consumption increased overall. Uh, and so they were fighting over not just market share, um, sort of, you know, that I have 25% of the market of cigarettes, you only have 24%, but they were also looking to increase then their total sales and their total revenue. Uh, I can only uh, kind of assume that the, the extent to which they advertised did contribute to that. I'm not sure that there's any way to, to prove it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you can put together, these are the number of ads. At some point, I might be able to say, this is the number of ads that Iwaya published in uh, the big three newspapers. This was their circulation. This is how many cigarettes he sold this year compared to the next year. I'm not sure if I'm be able to get at those statistics. Uh, but from everything I've read, the two of them really went all out in the early part of, of the 20th century. Um, 1900 through 1904, before the monopoly, total monopoly was established, um, and just flooded the marketplace with as many ads as they possibly could. Uh, and newspapers at that point did have very sizable circulations, and there were national newspapers. Uh, 
Uh, so again, I can only assume that their advertising had a positive effect for their sales record. Um, one of the questions I had was when you mentioned that the government took over a monopoly of the tobacco industry, you said that they were probably worried about Western control. That was exemplified by Mirai. Besides his infusion of capital that he got back in the 1800s, what else were the Western uh, tobacco industries essentially doing to fund him, if anything? Well, he created a joint stock company, so there was a permanent uh, kind of partnership that he established. Uh, beyond that, that's a, t a subject that I need to, I to investigate. I've, I've just begun to come across, come across more indications of what exactly, he, what, what more he was doing uh, with American tobacco. And that might entail getting at some of the, the answer, getting more at the, to the answer to your question, I think may very well require a trip down to North Carolina um, to, the, to Duke and the archives down there, uh, get into the heart of tobacco country. Um, but, um, Thank you for the question. I, that's something I do need to look at because it will further, uh, it will enable me to do more with with uh, the idea that the, the threat of American tobacco, the threat of, of foreign investment, foreign control, I, I can prove better uh, why that was a motivating factor. How does it fit in, and maybe this is your issue about advertising in general, but how does it fit into with the general rise of consumerism in Japan? excess wealth, creating needs which did not exist before, etc. Transition from subsistence purchase or, or use to what of a better term, luxury or from what I've read, I would say that tobacco really was, was at the cutting edge. Tobacco advertising was at the cutting edge of that. Uh, there's some work that's been done on consumer culture in the nineteen tens, more so the nineteen twenties, which suggests uh, that a modern consumer culture really didn't begin to develop until that point. It was very much urban oriented. It was geared towards the middle class and it helped to, the advertising itself helped to construct notions of what it meant to be modern, what it meant to be middle class. By the same token, you know, you engage in certain kinds of consumer habits that places in the middle class, the advertising helped to reinforce that. Uh, the advertising for tobacco I think really was at the, the beginning of that. Uh, and I'm not sure in this study if I'm going to go much beyond the Meiji period uh, into the 20th century, uh, partly out of interest. So when, is there opposition to tobacco? Is that, uh, so it sounds like, from, from your account, it sounds like everybody was smoking and it was a wonderful thing. Are there, are there voices in the yeah. wilderness saying, don't do that? Other missionaries. <laughs> <laughs> those killjoys. Yeah, exactly. The same ones who were encouraging temperance. Well, uh, I was, yeah, I was wondering about those people. No, uh, the, the opposition to tobacco, uh, I mean, this, the state opposed some use of tobacco, but simply because it wanted to control it for, for revenue purposes. Uh, those who had a more moralistic or physiological objection to tobacco didn't really begin to appear in, until the second half of the 18, 1880s. And the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, you know, led the way on this. Uh, and uh, began issuing a variety of different pamphlets and including uh, periodicals in its, in its monthly magazine decrying the, the evils of, of smoke. Actually, uh, some of the early world WC2 missionaries who traveled to Japan, their lecture tours, some of the lectures have been trend, are, are available in publication in Japanese, and they also speak to some of the, the health effects of smoking. So there was an opposition. It didn't go, I would say, mainstream until the last decade of the 19th century. And when I say it went mainstream, opposition to smoking moved, moved beyond the small community of Christian reformers who had moralistic as well as social objectives in mind with the reforms they promoted to gaining a, a non-religious support group. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with the Sino-Japanese War. Um, the Japanese won resoundingly, but by that point, studies that had been conducted in the West about the physical effects of smoking on recruits uh, the physical effect of uh, smoking on life expectancy, on economic productivity. Um, that had become very widely known in Japan. There was also information uh, in Japan about various kinds of schools, including the Virginia Military Institute, the Prussian Army, that were smoke-free. So in the context of war and the need to militarize more, to fight off uh, China and then Russia, 
uh, Japan became, or, or more Japanese became interested in trying to curtail smoking. Um, and the, the biggest step, again, was in 1900, when the National Diet in a mere three months passed legislation to ban smoking by minors. And there are questions as to how much that ban was implemented. I mean, I've come across police reports that say this number of youth in Tokyo were caught and had to pay a fine, and you know, the parents had to pay a fine and whatnot. Uh, but again, the, the fact that the National Diet passed it, the legislation was introduced by a Christian, uh, but it was passed by a, a body of legislators, legislators who uh, were not themselves. Uh, and that speaks to concern. There were also efforts by the government and the Ministry of Education to impose within the charters or the, the rules of schools, uh, government schools, um, uh, restrictions on smoking by youth. Uh, and again, part of that had to do with uh, an increasing desire to create youth as a special social category and manage them. Some of it also had to do with concerns about economic productivity, but we get back to uh, military and the need for, for soldiers who were, in fact, um, they had the lung capacity to carry a 40-pound 40 um, 40, 40 backpack um, across Siberia. Um, that was 1918. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate your questions. You've pointed out a number of different areas for further research on my part, um, and I appreciate those, those prompts. I've made some notes. Uh, again, maybe next year, I'll give you the update. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. I hope you can accept the small